Hello, my name is Janie Fulling. Today's date is March 28th, 2015, and I'm interviewing Alan Williams on the Ball State campus as part of the Ball State University African American Alumni Oral History Project. It's great to have you here today, Alan. Oh, thank you. I'm very glad to be here. Well, that's good okay. to hear. So, if you could just start by telling me when and where you were born. I was born in Chicago, Illinois, uh, November 24th, 1947. All right. Just a couple of days ago. <laughs> Um, and how long did you live in Chicago? Uh, for three years. Three years. Right. So you moved after that then? My family moved to uh, Michigan City, Indiana uh, in 1950 and moved to Michigan City, Indiana specifically and uh, resided in Michigan City uh, as a permanent residence uh, since that point. Wow. Um, so did you live with both of your parents as a child? Yes, yes. Both of my parents were present. Uh, uh, throughout uh, my childhood until my late teen years. My father passed away when I was a freshman at Ball State. Okay, um, and what were your parents' names? Uh, Eugene and uh, Myrtle Guerin, G-A-R-R-O-N. Um, and what were, what were they like during your childhood? Oh, I had a fantastic childhood. Uh, being the only child, uh, both parents uh, were very, very uh, um, interested in uh, my education. Um, my mother had uh, uh, some high school education. I think she left high school at the 10th uh, grade uh, level. And my father um, was one of the young men who uh, unfortunately had to uh, raise his brothers and sisters and had minimal education. So uh, they were very, very supportive. We had a lot of fun. I participated in virtually all kinds of activities, sports, uh, I was raised in the church, uh, an extended base of friends, uh, extended family, um, spent a lot of time in Chicago, uh, not only during my uh, uh, youth years, but also as I grew older. So even though I had moved away from Chicago, Chicago was still a second home primarily because we had a lot of relatives on both my mother and my father's side of the family. Okay. Um, yeah. What were... If you visited Chicago a lot, what were the differences you noticed between Chicago and Michigan City? Um, for me, there weren't a lot of differences early on because uh, I was primarily engaging in family type, at, family type activities. So it was the, the family in Michigan City extended to the family and, and friends in Chicago. Later on, as I spent more time, uh, I became independent of my family and I started to explore Chicago and, and uh, visit uh, different areas, uh, experience different cultures, uh, just find out more about the community in, in, in general. Uh, during my teen years, uh, I was fortunate enough to have a car. Uh, so as a result, me and my friends spent a lot of time not only uh, at social activities in Chicago, but we visited museums, uh, we went to games, we went to different types of events uh, that uh, later on proved very beneficial for us. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, you said you had an extended base of friends and family, mm -hmm. and um, we read The Other Side of Middle Town as a class, which mm -hmm. is about um, black communities in America, and specifically mm -hmm. Muncie and other Midwest areas. Mm -hmm. And I know um, many black neighborhoods and community, they put children like at the center of the home and the community. Did your neighbors and your extended family and friends, did they take any part in raising you? Uh, yes. Um, in Michigan City, uh, as a matter of fact, I'm writing a book about uh, the area that I grew up in. It was a, a neighborhood called The Patch. Uh, the Patch was an area that uh, was I say 97 uh, percent African American. Uh, it was um, probably less than a mile square, uh, but it was very, very insulated uh, uh, during those periods. If you go back to the uh, the 50s and the early 60s, uh, it was a different climate. People had relationships with each other, so as a result those people were involved in uh, the raising of not only their kids but the other kids. I spent a lot of time at uh, my friends' homes. Uh, we would uh, 
exchange overnight visits. Uh, our parents knew each other. Our parents knew who we were. Uh, so it, it wasn't uh, similar to what you see in some uh, some neighborhoods today where neighbors don't know who they, who is their next door neighbors. Uh, residents don't know who their next door neighbors are and they don't know who their friends are. Ours was totally different in that uh, we were uh, we were in intertwined and uh, it was a positive situation even though a lot of the people in that neighborhood were um, I, I won't say poor uh, economically they didn't have the the same um, wherewithal that uh, people had in the other parts of the community but that drew them together that was a that was a, a commonality that existed and uh, people didn't see themselves as poor people saw themselves as just friends and neighbors and so there was a lot of interaction uh, there were weekend gatherings uh, uh, picnics cookouts uh, the church that was uh, in our neighborhood uh, served uh, multiple purposes uh, a religious, a meeting place, uh, some place where you could congregate. In the basement of our church was a place called Elite Youth Center, uh, and Elite was uh, a focal point of not only the patch area but the entire uh, black community within Michigan City. Uh, students, kids came from all over the uh, community to participate in the recreational activities and the growth activities that were provided there at, uh, at Elite. So, so it, it, was, uh, it was quite a positive uh, uh, situation uh, that we were in, uh, much, as I say, much different than what I sometimes see in uh, closed pocket neighborhoods now. So. Sounds like you had a great sense of community. I, I did, I did, and it's, it's carried over. That is where you will see uh, uh, with a lot of uh, people that uh, grew up in the patch. I mean, I can name people who have gone on to be of service to the community, the police chief, the fire chief, lawyers, doctors, uh, Richard Hatcher, the mayor of Gary. I mean, you just go on and on with people who came out of that insulated environment and were able to uh, capture that closeness and that passion and that compassion and, this, and spread it out. And so you see a lot of those people that went on to uh, uh, share those kinds of things uh, wherever they may have been, not just in Michigan City, but uh, elsewhere also. Do you think um, that that sense of community then helps, just in general, helps people to become more successful as they grow older and they branch out beyond that community? I think it's one of the, uh, one of the uh, more important um, components. I think one has to, uh, first of all, to develop a sense of self, who you are and uh, uh, how you came to be, develop a confidence in yourself. But in doing that, you have to understand the role and the uh, support that you have gained from other people. Uh, I wouldn't be the person that I am without the many, many, many role models and caregivers and, and people who took an interest in making sure early on and during my youth years, during my teen years, uh, uh, that I was doing the right things, that I was in the right positions, uh, and, and, and sharing the importance of, of, of giving back. You know, so, so you see that, and uh, if you're a person that's in tune with that, then that becomes part of your, your you know, not only your personality, but your being, and you, you extend that uh, as, as you continue to go forth. I think that was one of the reasons that I've remained uh, affiliated with Ball State University over the years. Uh, Ball State is a part of that same developmental process at a later stage in my life. And it was a very meaningful part of my life. And so as a result, I, I have an affinity to give back to Ball State, but also to share with other people uh, uh, all of the, the uh, different aspects of my life at Ball State and for the most part they've been very positive.
Yeah. You know. um, so you talked a little bit about your role models then. Mm -hmm. What specifically did, like what sort of values did they ingrain in you? What kind of role models did you have? Uh, the, the first one that I would say is, is uh, value would be uh, integrity and, and, and honesty. Um, that came from my grandmother. My grandmother had a saying that uh, the truth stands alone, the lie needs a prop. And I've shared that over the years when I talk to people. If what you're doing is correct, if what you're doing is right, if what you're doing is the right thing to do, you don't have to worry about defending it or, or having to prove it to other people. It's the right thing to do. So she said, the truth stands alone, the, the, a lie needs a prop. So integrity has been one of those. Mutual respect. Um, um, communication. Uh, listening to what other people have to say. Uh, learning that you don't always have all of the answers. Um, so those, those kinds of things that are, are, are very important to me. Uh, being empathetic. You know, I don't know if that's a value, but uh, that's one of the things that I, I try to do. And I've, I've translated that into personal life, business life, social life, and, 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 and different uh, ways that I deal with other people. And I find that it works. It works. People want to be engaged with folks who uh, not only can help them, but sometimes just be a listener, someone that can uh, encourage, motivate, uh, say things that uh, are not sh mover and shaker type things, but just be there in support of them. So. So all of those things really emanate from the, the early years and, uh, as I said, the, uh, the consistent relationships that I had uh, uh, in the patch, in the church, in the school, uh, just reinforced over and over again the importance of it. So. Mm -hmm. And so with those relationships, I know you said you did a lot of like recreational activities mm -hmm. both in and out of school. Can you tell me a little more about that? Uh, well, I have to talk about Charlie Westcott at Elite Youth Center uh, because, uh, uh, well, I can't talk about Charlie without talking about the church. I was put in the leadership roles early on in life. Uh, I think I've been probably a leader since I was about five or six years old. Uh, I was always asked to, to do certain things. I was provided an opportunity to have experiences that other uh, young folks didn't have, uh, whether that be uh, sports. Uh, I'll give you an example. I was put in a situation where I was doing peer counseling when I was 11 years old at Elite. Uh, Mr. Westcott just came up to me and he says, I got a problem and I don't think I'll be able to deal with it because I'm too old. He needs to hear somebody his age talk to him. So, so we're dealing with peer counseling um, in terms of sports. Uh, we had uh, an IC baseball league, and a lot of the African American students would, uh, kids, I keep saying students, would, uh, would play among themselves and did not participate in the baseball league. Well, again, Mr. Westcott uh, encouraged us if, uh, if we really want to learn how to play baseball and do it the right way, take our skills to the city league. And so we took our skills to the City League, and, and I have to say the first year, I think seven of us were all-stars, but that's, that's beside the point. The fact that uh, we were engaging in uh, activities and areas that heretofore we didn't. I can remember participating in a table tennis tournament at the YMCA. We played table tennis every night at Elite, but nobody knew how good we were until I went to the YMCA and we played and I won, you know, that, that sort of thing. So always uh, stepping into new horizons. That was one of the things that uh, uh, was encouraged by uh, my parents to church, to the youth director, is, is, is stepping into new horizons. And that's one of the things that I'm trying to share with young people today. You know, enrich your life, do something uh, beyond the comfort zone, challenge yourself, those kinds of things. So. 
Um, you mentioned the City Baseball League. Was mm -hmm. that an integrated league? or? Uh, yes, it was integrated. It was integrated, but just there weren't very many uh, uh, blacks that were participating. Um, and you have to understand the times. Mm -hmm. uh, the times were such that uh, nobody told you that you couldn't play, but uh, there were things that uh, you didn't feel comfortable about participating, you didn't feel comfortable about, uh, about playing, so you stayed away. And that was not only baseball, but that's other things in, 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 in communities. So, uh, so as a result, uh, we didn't participate for a long time, and then when we did, uh, I won't say we opened the door, but uh, it was the first time that large a number of, of kids started to play. And so we played you know, park basketball, then we played school basketball. Now, when we were in, when we were in elementary school, uh, I think we had, uh, at that time, I don't know, maybe 16 elementary schools in Michigan City, but there were about four that were predominantly African-American, and now at that level, they won everything. It was either Central, Central was so large that they had two of everything, Central One and Central Two. And then we had Park, and then we had Riley, and we had Eastport. And they pretty much dominated the sports at that particular point in time. Uh, but uh, and then there were the extracurricular activities that we got involved in, and uh, uh, the mentors in the school system. Uh, Bob Hood, uh, Del Lonzo, all of those folks, Jerry Carsons, that were constantly uh, uh, encouraging and challenging and pushing and and supporting us to uh, do other things, so. Okay. Um, and when, I know you said you sort of opened the door by joining the baseball league that didn't have very many black No, I, I didn't open the door. Right. We sort of just, we just increased the number. Increased we, the number. We gave greater visibility to it, and as a, as a result, more students came on after us. There were some people that uh, were there. Uh, now, you have to remember, during that era, uh, Michigan City had a minor league baseball team and uh, uh, they were a um, franchise of the Giants, the San Francisco Giants. And so baseball was very, very big. And there were all black semi-pro, there was an all black semi-pro team in Michigan City. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, on, our, on our minor league team, uh, Juan Marichal, that was his first start he started in Michigan City, Jose Turnbull, John Orsino, the Alus, all of those guys started in Michigan City. So baseball was very big. So I gravitated to baseball and that was my best sport. I really played a lot of baseball. I played baseball until I was 20 in, in different leagues. Uh, so uh, it, uh, it was a good move for a lot of kids because baseball was the basketball of our era and then basketball comes along and it supplants that, so. Do you think sports um, serves as a way to bring people from different areas of life and mm -hmm. different places together? Mm -hmm. Sports is probably one of the primary um, um, elements in society that does that because uh, sports, if handled correctly, focuses on all of the uh, skill sets and requirements that you need to be successful in life. You, know, you have to have the teamwork, you have to have uh, the communication, you have to uh, uh, be able to uh, survive difficult situations and circumstances. And as a result, and there are other things, but as a result, there's a reliance on your teammates. And that reliance supersedes race and supersedes ethnicities and all of those kinds of things. And so you look at what does it take for us uh, as a group of men or women to uh, achieve an end goal. And so as a result, you all are put in a situation where you're working together. You're working uh, uh, for the common purpose, for a common purpose. And as a result, uh, you, you, you learn so much from that. And I think the friendships that you, you establish in sports, uh, a lot of them are lifelong types, like friendships. 
and uh, uh, but it, it's it's a vehicle if it's used properly. Um, you know, there there is there is so much to be gained from from sports. Um, the, the the ability to persevere under different difficult situations, the ability to deliver deliver results. Um, those are all things that I I use in business. I used to use in business. You know, uh, the training process, uh, uh, understanding other people, all of those kinds of things. Uh, so I you can take them right from sports and put them in school, put them in business, uh, there's, a, there's a line, there's a, that leads, you know, through the, uh, through all three of them. That's an interesting way to think about it. I like that. Well, and, and you know, I, I think differently than most people, but uh, that was, uh, you know, I, I think winning is, is important, don't get me wrong, but winning is not an end all for me, and was not an end all for me in sports, because uh, I think that if you give all that you you can give, if you give 100% and you fall short, then you fall short. The other team is better than you. But if you don't, uh, then there are some things that uh, you need to work on. I, I can remember one thing, and, I, and I've used this over and over and over in, in years, and I learned this in basketball. I used to have a coach named Jerry Carstens, and uh, he used to have this saying, and I, I translated it to life, and I translated it to business. And it was simply when we were practicing at night, and we were in ninth grade basketball, and he would say, first man, catch the last man. Last man, don't let the first man catch you. And people say, oh, okay, that's a gobbledygook. What is that? And it simply means that if you're the person that is on top, or you're in the person that's in the first position, you have the responsibility to work every single day to remain in that position. You can't slough off, you can't relax, you have to go out and give your best every single day. And if you're the last man, then your responsibility is to do everything that is required to become the first man. If you have deficiencies, you need to work on those. If you had shortcomings, then you need to overcome those kinds of things. And it was just simply put, first man catch the last man, last man don't let the first man catch you. And I used to tell that to supervisors that work for me that, you know, what I'm looking for is someone that uh, uh, has that spirit, who has that, uh, uh, that goal orientation uh, that they're going to put forth their best every single day. That doesn't mean that you're going to be successful every day, but you're going to put forth your best every day. And as a result, if you do that, most of the times you're going to come out ahead. So. so you lived that philosophy, obviously, in sports, and you lived it in business. Mm -hmm. But what about um, in school, when you, in high school, middle school, elementary school? Well, um, I was a very successful student in elementary school and most of uh, junior high school. And I'll be honest, I, I, I had an ego that got in the way when I was in junior high school because I wasn't selected for uh, this all academic uh, group. And I withdrew basically from participating to the level that I should have participated. But uh, later on, uh, there were a couple of teachers that uh, really sat down and talked to me about working up to my potential. Uh, Jerry Carsons came along and, and we, we talked about a lot of things. And Jerry was not only uh, uh, an influence in my life, he also was an influence later in my son's life. Um, but um, uh, I, I really wasn't that focused on grades. Uh, and, and I say that because I didn't think that grades were a true measure of who I was and what I could do. And again, maybe that's the ego, maybe that's the confidence or whatever. Uh, but I saw people that, uh, that had good grades that uh, uh, I just felt that, you know, I had a broader set of skills. And so as a result, uh, you know, I didn't work quite as well as I should have, or as hard as I should have to, uh, to do it uh, uh, a lot of the time. 
Uh, I was in college prep, but that was okay. You know, it's, I, knew I, was, I knew I was going to college. I knew all these things were going to happen and all of those things. So uh, that just wasn't my focus, you know, in terms of uh, getting grades. I took all the courses, you know, but uh, uh, I said I sort of had an independent schedule, mm -hmm. so to speak. But that, it sounds like that that sort of got you in contact with a lot of teachers who were willing to help you. Yeah, and, and, and the help wasn't academic help. I, I, didn't, I didn't receive any academic help from them. I, I received help uh, in terms of uh, personality development, uh, uh, internal stability, uh, dealing with uh, competitive issues. And, uh, for example, Del Lonzo, you know, he, he talked to me from the standpoint that if you really felt that uh, uh, you were excited from this group, then uh, when, what had happened is that uh, I knew coming out of el elementary school I was probably one of the top five academic students in Michigan City. Uh, but when they formed this group, uh, there were some limits that were put on the number of African Americans that were out there that would be on the group. And so I wasn't selected and uh, some other students that weren't African American were selected ahead of me and I thought I was wrong. And I did not know how to verbalize that or address that situation. And I never even talked about it with my parents. I made a personal decision that I was going to withdraw from high uh, um, academic pursuit. I would do my own thing. You know, I would do it on my terms, you know, and I wasn't going to share with anybody else, you know, which was a very immature, but when you're in the seventh and eighth grade, uh, that, that's what things happen. And it wasn't until later, uh, we were in the 10th grade, when that group broke up and those kids returned back to the normal college prep program, that uh, uh, some of these teachers were talking with me and uh, saying, now is your chance. Go get them, you know, show them, you know. And uh, I, uh, I did that. I did that because now we were in the same uh, playing field. And uh, so I, I was able to do some things. But I learned some uh, things about myself, good and bad, you know, and how I handled that. And uh, ironically, it was a situation that I was faced with, you know, years, years later uh, with my son in regard to basketball. And uh, so it happened for a reason. I think it happened for a reason didn't understand it, didn't know all about it. I just know that this is how I'm going to handle this situation. And it was really the inappropriate way. Um, but I learned from it, and that's the most important thing. So. Mm -hmm. um, and do you think maybe the, did the white students who were selected for the student group before you, maybe even though they weren't as qualified, did you see that as a form of discrimination when you were in junior high? Well, I just saw it as wrong. I didn't really think of it in terms of discrimination. I really just thought it was wrong because it's, it, it, it's like anything else. If, if, if I'm sitting there with you or in uh, situations where we are, are, are working together, you pretty much get a feel for what each of you can contribute, what each of your strengths are, what you can do, and so you know. And when you see situations where there's something about this is not right, you know, you know, so I know it, it's sort of like uh, if you're if you're an athlete and you know you're a really good player and they're putting people in front of you, you've got to think what 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 happened here. Now it's how you respond to that that makes the difference. I responded incorrectly and inappropriately. But I learned from that, and I was able to recover and uh, get another uh, uh, chance to address that situation later on. But I didn't call it discrimination at that point, uh, even though I knew that there were just discriminatory situations that were occurring all over the place. I just felt like they did me wrong, you know, that uh, uh, I should have been there. But, you know, once it, was, once it happened, uh, I made a decision, and I didn't dwell on it anymore. I didn't dwell on it anymore. I went ahead and just did what I needed to do. So it, it wasn't one of those things where every day I woke up, you know, thinking about it, to what can I do, those kinds of things. So 
it was a, a, a small picture, a small snapshot, and that was it. Uh, so how did, you, how did you recover from that? Well, as I said, uh, when we went into our sophomore years, that group had been disbanded. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, I started to uh, focus a little bit more uh, because uh, of those, you know, all of those students were now, we we're in the same uh, classes for the most part. And so I just focused more on, on what I needed to do. Uh, I still had friendships with those people. They weren't any means of mine because they didn't make the decision. I had friendships with those people all, all along. So uh, as a result, it was just uh, demonstrating, you know, uh, from a personal standpoint, if nothing else, that, uh, uh, that we were uh, fairly complimentary, you know, in terms of what, uh, what skill sets uh, that we had, so. Okay. Um, so is there anything else you'd like to talk about as far as your high school years? Uh, no, high school was a great time. High school was really a, a great time uh, uh, for me. Um, it was a period that, uh, as I said earlier, I found out a lot about who I was and uh, uh, found out how to make, I think, decisions that were more appropriate. Um, a lot of friends uh, developed a lot of relationship with teachers that have lasted for you that lasted for years. A lot of them have passed away now, um, but uh, no, high school was 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 really good. You know, once I got to that level, I enjoyed it. So, so what made you make the decision to come to Ball State then? My mother had always wanted to be a teacher. And um, I, I was interested in becoming a teacher in part because of some of the relationships that I had with teachers and some of the observations I had seen uh, with teachers um, having a positive influence in students' lives. And so that was, um, that was one of the reasons. It actually came down to two schools. It was Western Michigan and Ball State. And um, I actually got accepted to Western Michigan and was going to Western Michigan and went there and didn't really like Western Michigan. I didn't go to, I didn't attend. I went and I didn't like Western Michigan, so I didn't come back. And uh, I came to Ball State and I developed a, uh, a very good relationship with, uh, with a lot of people very quickly. And uh, that, that was good. That was very, very good for me. So uh, uh, wanting to be a teacher, Ball State being a teacher's college at that particular point, uh, didn't become a university until that uh, winter quarter, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so it was the place. It was really the place. Why did you want to study teaching? Just because of your mother? Or? Well, because of my mother and because of the, uh, like I said earlier, the, the, the observations and the influences I had seen with other teachers. I thought teachers were um, an extension of that caregiver role that I talked about earlier. Um, um, so uh, teachers have always been very important in the African American community, at least they were during my, my youth. Uh, if a person uh, was identified as a teacher, then they were elevated to a certain sta status. Uh, so that was, uh, that was uh, important. Um, and I fast forward, I won't say that we were limited to that height, but there's a dis uh, in terms of blacks that were graduating from college, a lot of them were going into education during a certain period of time. And there, it was, I don't know, disproportionate is the right word, but they were not uh, going into other fields. And there could be a thousand reasons why. Uh, some of them could be discriminatory. Some of them could be that there's a glass ceiling. I don't know all of that, but uh, uh, 
there were a lot of folks going into education. So it was seen in high, as, a, as a high status position in the community. Uh, you were respected uh, uh, in part because of not only education that you had attained, but also the role that you played. And in most areas, you knew the families, you knew the kids. And so there was a, a high element of respect there, so. Mm -hmm. um, so you said you built relationships pretty much right off the bat when you came to Ball State. Yeah, I did. I did. First day I was here, uh, I met two people. The first person I met was Albert Hazelwood, and the second person I met was Larry Hines. And that is now, uh, it'll be 50 years ago, and we're still friends. Wow. Uh, and uh, Albert, I was walking to the administration building, and uh, Larry I probably met about a day later, and uh, Larry didn't have a place to stay. And at that point, I was staying over in Neuer with a, uh, uh, my roommate was white, his name was Ron Pierce, and he was from Crown Point. And so, uh, not really even knowing Larry, he says, hey, can I stay with you guys for a day or so? Ron's, uh, being from Crown Point, his dad was a teacher and a coach at Gary Frable High School. So Ron was very acclimated to being around, uh, you know, blacks. And so he said, sure. Well, that, that couple days turned into like almost a month. <laughs> you know, and we, and we joke about it now, you know, but uh, once I got to the dorm, there were people like Homer, Homer Jackson, uh, who was there, um, John McCoy, and some other people that uh, uh, were good people. I recognized very, very quickly they were good people. And then uh, after that, uh, it just sort of spread. Now you have to understand, <laughs> uh, at Ball State, there was, uh, wasn't a large African-American enrollment. Um, one of the things that I had written uh, I tried to identify at one time, from my perspective, the uh, events that, uh, the most important events in terms of the African American student experience at Ball State. And uh, the first one I put was that uh, Ball State going from a teacher's college to a university. And the reason I had that as number one is because being a teacher's college the demographic that came to Ball State at that point was uh, pretty constant and, 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 and fairly stagnant. They were people who wanted to be teachers. They were overwhelmingly African, excuse me, white, not African American. They were limited. The, the disciplines that we had at Ball State uh, were not as expansive as they became when we went into a university status. As a university status, we now kicked everything up a notch. Uh, by expanding the number of disciplines that we serve, we now drew from a larger demographic. If you look at the 60s, you now have a larger pool of African American students attending college. So Ball State was dealing with all of those particular issues at that particular time. So that was a transformation, not only in name, but in uh, their educational responsibilities, their philosophies, uh, enrollment, all of those kinds of things. So, uh, and as a result of being a small group on a predominantly white campus, uh, we naturally gravitated to each other. And in doing that, uh, we sort of insulated ourselves uh, when it came to addressing different needs or situations or issues. Uh, so that was very important. So. Uh, when I got there, I, I saw a lot. I saw some of that. The first thing I think the first weekend I was here, I went to a party and I was like, "Whoa, man! You know, it's a good time." But uh, I, I, when you can sit there, uh, I can remember Larry and I. This was probably towards spring semester. We we were able to actually name every African American student on campus. We knew them all which tells you there weren't that many. You know, we knew them all. We could name every African-American student on campus. Um, but, uh, you know, again, that, that created a situation where the university uh, started to evolve and started to expand and grow in a lot of ways. So.
Well, I know that um, you lived in Neuer, at least when you first started at Ball mm -hmm, State. Mm -hmm. but, um, Neuer and Wagner at one time, yeah. Okay. But I know that um, there wasn't, especially in the 60s, there was a hard time for African-American students to find off-campus housing. Mm -hmm. Did you know anything about that? Yeah, I think John Buckner and I were uh, two of the... Um, people that uh, really uh, bucked that rule. At uh, the time that I came here, um, you could not live off campus unless you were an upperclassman. And uh, uh, for me, the situation changed dramatically when my father died. I no longer had the economic wherewithal to live on campus, and uh, it was easier for me to move off campus. So. I moved uh, over to Cold Street Apartments, 615 South Cole, and John and I. Um, and uh, it was challenged, but it wasn't strongly challenged. Nobody sought to kick us out of school or anything of that nature. Um, eventually, over the, n the numerous years that I was here, I lived all over the city. Uh, there were some areas where it was uh, very difficult to uh, uh, get apartments or get housing uh, off campus. Uh, I did not experience a lot of that because the areas that I chose to live in uh, were for the most part in the city and for the most part in uh, uh, African-American neighborhoods. So I didn't experience that because I wasn't trying to live behind the tally or I wasn't trying to live, you know, on McKinley or anything of that nature. So I, I didn't personally experience that, but I knew that it was, it was taking place. Uh, uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I lived in different areas, uh, you know, in, in the city, and it was, it was very convenient for me. I learned the Muncie bus system because I couldn't bring, bring a car down here. When I finally did bring a car down here, it was actually easier, but... Uh, uh, there were a lot of things that were going on um, in the Muncie community and at Ball State that um, I chose to write about in, in an alumnus article uh, back in the uh, late 90s. And I did not call it racism, and I didn't really call it discrimination. I call it more of a traditionalist attitude uh, because I, I look back on it and I saw the Muncie community and the Ball State environment were all dealing with society in transition. The, the whole world was dealing with society in transition. And the whole world did not have answers. So it was sort of naive on the part of us to think that Ball State was ready for uh, these massive changes. Uh, at the same time, we came in with a level of expectations that were brought from traditionally urban areas into Middletown that uh, uh, were probably not reasonable at the same time also. I can, I can remember uh, some of my friends dealing with the, the rules of the dorm. When I came down, um, there was a curfew, social probation. Um, you had to dress in a coat and tie for a Sunday dinner. I mean, there are a lot of things that students who are not used to doing, some of them, doesn't matter what the ethnicity was, but um, when you're talking curfew to a guy who lives in Gary and who works at the steel, has worked at the steel mill for three summers, and you're going to tell him he has to be in the dorm at 10 o'clock at night, what are you going to get? You're going to get resistance to that rule. So eventually, you know, and I'm just using that as an example as, as some, of the, some of the different things that that, that we had, and, and uh, even with our fraternity, I think you talked to Foster, you guys talked to Foster Stevens, and Foster was talking about uh, um, our meetings with Dean Collier, and the question is, why do you need more than one black fraternity? And I just pointed down the row, and I said, have you been down to fraternity row? Why do they need more than one white fraternity? You know, 
uh, those kinds of, of issues where there wasn't an understanding, that there wasn't a comprehension, you know, of the students that were now, uh, the total student base that was now enrolled in Ball State. It was still being viewed from a limited student base, from my perspective. That's my, just my perspective of it. So, but to give the university credit, I think the university started to realize that, started to understand that with prodding, with threats, with demonstrations, with all of those things, but also with uh, an, an honest effort to, uh, to create change within the university. I think from my perspective, John Pruis was the, the catalyst behind a lot of that. And uh, I think he made a tremendous difference here at Ball State for the African-American students. Matter of fact, he's on my event list. I think that uh, uh, he changed the tone. Uh, he helped change the tone. And uh, as, as a result, there was some progress that was made and uh, things improved dramatically under his administration. Um, and when you talk about protests and demonstrations, what were you involved in? Probably all of them, you know. Uh, probably the one that everybody thinks was one of the most significant ones was that uh, they were recognizing the 50th anniversary of John R. Emmons. And it was over in uh, Emmons Auditorium and it was being televised, I think, uh, within Indiana. Uh, and I don't know the specific cities that it was in. But we had approached uh, the administration about uh, some things that uh, we felt that were important. Uh, one of them was uh, having a, um, uh, what we called a black house at that point, but it really is more of a special programs house. Uh, more teachers, uh, uh, more teachers who were responsive to black students, uh, you know, and, and several other things. But uh, we were not really getting the responses that we felt were appropriate. And again, a lot of that was uh, being handled by Dean Collier, Dean Kenneth Collier. I hate to mention his name, but I have to. Um, and uh, so our, our thought was that we're not going to really get the, uh, the attention or the response that we need unless we try alternative means. So during this, uh, during this address and this recognition process, we put two students in the middle of every row in Emmons Auditorium, every row. And when John R. Emmons rose to speak, we all stood up, when we were all dressed in coat and ties, we all stood up and exited to each end of the row, which meant that we disrupted the entire program, the entire program because we did it by sections. So it didn't just end and go away. And we just did it quietly, no comment, you know, left the building, left the building. There was a lot of, there was feedback. How dare they, you know, all, I mean, a lot of anger, a lot of emotion initially. But I think uh, through that, uh, we were able to get uh, uh, the ear of some people and that began some of the dialogue that was really necessary. Uh, but that was probably, uh, I would say, the, the most um, visible and the most effective. Uh, and, I, and I know, I, I think I have that in my archives notes because those were the, like, the original notes that uh, we took for that particular night. There were others that were loosely organized. Um, and, and they weren't so much as university gains, but they were targeted for particular issues. There were basketball disruptions and things of that nature. There were some marches that uh, took place, you know, on campus that uh, said that Ball State was discriminatory and things of that nature. But I don't think any of them uh, got the, uh, the visibility or held the importance of the uh, uh, disruption of John R. because it, everybody was there. Everybody who is anybody in education was there. And uh, uh, they didn't know. They didn't know. But 
that was just one of the vehicles that, that worked. And I think after that, as I said, we started to have some dialogue and eventually um, these special programs under the Student Affairs Department was formed. And uh, uh, Robert Foster and Bob Cody were hired to uh, as, as director and assistant director. Actually, uh, George was hired before them. They came a year after he did. But they were the ones who maintained it over the years and who, uh, who did the critical work. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's Dean Byrell and some other people that uh, were really uh, supportive of those types of activities. So. And did that special programs office, do you think it worked? Do you think it did its job? Oh, it did its job. It did its job. First of all, it, it, it provided a haven, a safe haven in a sense for the African-American students to, uh, to go. Uh, students that didn't feel comfortable hanging out at the dorm or didn't feel comfortable over here, over there, uh, they gravitated to the special programs house. So for a number of years, it was, <coughs> it was the place. Secondly, uh, it provided uh, some academic activities that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that, um, uh, assisted students in their their growth development and uh, their retention and things of that nature which a lot of folks don't talk about that aspect of it uh, I was fortunate enough to receive a graduate fellowship after I finally graduated from Ball State and I worked in uh, on special programs and uh, our Lex and myself put together what we called at that point a freshman survival program and if you look at the freshman survival program, a lot of the things that we were talking about and, and, uh, and trying to do on a, um, what I say, targeted, restricted basis are the tenets that eventually became part of Freshman Connections. Not to say that we created Freshman Connections, but it was the same philosophy, the same mindset, and those kinds of things where we took, we took targeted students and uh, we developed uh, study plans. We had they had specific classes that they had to participate in, in addition to their regular classes. And there was follow up and uh, you know, a lot of different uh, wraparound type activities uh, that uh, uh, were existent through the uh, the special programs uh, house. And then there was uh, there were activities. There were there were pageants. There were picnics. There were uh, Excuse me. There were trips. Um, um, they brought in speakers, um, and and when the university brought in uh, some of the entertainers and some of the speakers, they made their way to the special programs house for as part of their reception type activities. So there were a lot of uh, again support type uh, things that were done through special programs that uh, uh, had it not been there probably would have been dispersed over numerous organizations if they would have occurred, if they would have occurred. But because uh, it, special program was there, it was a centralized area that could, <coughs> could cover a lot of those things. And um, the other thing was uh, uh, the academic follow-up for students in general because they had access to students' grades and things of that nature. Uh, they could sometimes just talk to some of the students that were deficient. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. But uh, um, that's one of the reasons that I, I, I really hope that we can get Bob Cody in here uh, for an interview because Bob, uh, boy, uh, he's got a story to tell on, on, uh, on what they were able to do and. Uh, and the support that they got from the university, as I said, it wasn't that they, they did it all in isolation, but uh, uh, <coughs> it was very effective. Mm -hmm. And it's morphed into the multicultural office now. And the multicultural office operates in a different time continuum, totally different time continuum. The students that are here now have different sets of needs, they respond. Uh, differently, the university has grown and has changed as compared to the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. Uh, so as a result, you don't get the same level of participation and there is, there's, they don't have the same needs. So it's broader base in terms of the ethnicities that it serves and uh, 
that's okay. That's okay. But during that particular period, uh, it helped defuse situations before they got out of hand. <laughs> so, and, and some other things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, you sort of described the Office of Special Programs as a centralized hub for the African American community mm -hmm. at Ball State, mm -hmm. which um, sounds really similar to me to the church in African American communities, for example, in Michigan City, and then I know here in Muncie. Mm -hmm. um, were you involved out in Muncie at all, or in any churches or anything like that while you were here? No, I, I, I personally was not uh, in, in, in involved in a church. I would attend church periodically, but that was all. I would just attend the church. I was not a member. Um, some of my friends, uh, 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 especially those from Muncie were, were very involved in the church and I would visit some of their churches but I did not uh, I did not engage in uh, uh, a membership or, or do that but there were things that they did with the um, with the uh, special programs house uh, the choirs and they actually had some visitations to churches you know things of that nature uh, for students who wanted to go to church you know and didn't have a church uh, but I, uh, that's all I did is I would attend periodically. I was not uh, uh, doing the same sorts of things that I would have done at home in the church. But um, why do you think it's important to have this centralized hub for these activities for the African American community in different places? Well, why do I think it now or then? Then. Because then I, I think it's a different situation then you, you, you were dealing with, uh, again, uh, a lot of societal issues at that point. Uh, if you want me to say discrimination and racism and institutional racism and, and, all, and all of those kinds of things, yes, those things were, were, were prevalent. And sometimes I think even if it didn't exist here at Ball State, because it was occurring where you were in your home area or whatever, you still felt the same way. And so as a result, uh, uh, you, 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 you need some place where you can um, escape that, where you can diffuse that, uh, that, that stress that's building up, uh, where you can talk to people, uh, I, I mean, there, there, there needs to be a balance. You know, that's one of the things that I, I, I talk a lot to people about now, is having a balance in your life. And back then we didn't understand the concept of balance, but we needed it, and we needed to do that. Fraternity served as part of that. The social life served as part of that, uh, where you could get away from uh, the every day, every day to something that's uh, uh, an escape. And so not to say the special programs was just totally an escape, but it served a a as that, and it served as a reinforcement for people who um, didn't go home a lot, you know, who were here on campus. Uh, so they spent a lot of time over at the special programs house, and because of the variety of activities, it was three floors and at that time, and you could just sometimes go down in the basement and just listen to music and play cards and have group activities and things of that nature that um, uh, were stress relievers. That got you away from the, the, the rigors of going to class every day. Because uh, I think um, uh, in putting together some of the plans that we had for the students, a lot of the students were not necessarily prepared for the, um, I won't say the rigors, but the demands of being in a higher education institution. Mm -hmm. So as a result, you know, they came in with uh, s bad study habits and bad uh, uh, skills that were, were not conducive for being successful. And so uh, uh, we were able to not only address that uh, on campus, but we brought people back. We brought, brought back graduates uh, uh, who could come in and mentor 
and, uh, and, and talk with those students about real life situations. I've been through it, this is how I handle it, you know, those kinds of things. And so those kinds of things were very, very helpful to a lot of our students. And again, I, I, I'm not short selling multicultural affairs because we're different, dealing with a different world right now. But back then, those things were, uh, were very, very important. So it did take the whole community to raise that child. And uh, again, as I said, I give credit to Ball State for recognizing a lot of those, uh, those needs and putting some things into place that would allow those to occur, so. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I want to ask a little bit more about your personal involvement in Ball State. I know you were a member of a black fraternity on campus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you, I think I saw something about being a president of the Association of International Relations Clubs, maybe? No, I was uh, on campus, I was, um, uh, a member of Omega Psi Phi fraternity, mm -hmm. and uh, I was president of the pledge group, president of the fraternity. Uh, I was involved in some of the regional activities, and uh, that was a um, that was a very good situation for me. Uh, now you have to understand our fraternity, and everybody brags on their fraternity, but. Our fraternity really had a strong, strong group of black men. Uh, our first pledge group, uh, our first group when we were trying to found a fraternity, that was in the, the founding group uh, here at Ball State. Um, and there were eight of us, and uh, I think we came out with a lawyer, a dentist, uh, an educator who's now a congressman, uh, human resource manager, myself as director of operations. Uh, Tony was a manager, and Vince was HR also. So that group was a very strong, I, I call it the alpha dog group. I don't know how we got along because we all were, you know. <laughs> but um, uh, I was very proud of our group and very pr proud of those guys who came after us. Um, in, in terms of the, uh, the other involvements, I was involved in the Black Student Association. Uh, that sort of came natural. When President Pruis came along, he appointed me to uh, a leadership group that they had here on campus. Uh, and that's all it was called, just really a leadership, leadership conference group. And we met every Saturday. Um, uh, I got involved with uh, the Panhellenic Council. I got involved with the intramural sports, uh, things of that nature. Um, dabbled a little bit in some of the people in politics that was going on at that particular point in time. Uh, so I, 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 I guess you say I, I, I did a lot of things, you know, um, that were not big time, but they were important, you know. I, I think one of the things that I, I saw my role as was uh, trying to um, make sure that we as black students on this campus uh, uh, maintained our focus and uh, were able to be successful as a whole. You know, so there were, there, were, there were meetings and different things that we did to uh, promote that, so. Okay. But, uh, but no, I wasn't in international relations, uh, per se. Um, like I said, the, in, anything that anybody asked me to do for the most part, if I thought it was worthy, I would plug into it. If it proved not, I'd, you know, leave that alone, you know, for the most part, because I had too much that was going on. Yeah. yeah, you were definitely busy. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you put on your your form that you gave to us that you were pursuing your undergraduate from 1965 mm -hmm. until 1973. Mm -hmm. That is, I think, what's that's quite a few years. So. No, not really. I think it's perspective. Okay. If you're looking at it from a time frame, you say it's a lot of years. If you're looking at it from a real life perspective, it's not. My father died. Uh, the breadwinner is gone, so what you thought was going to be a financially uh, financially easy 
uh, time period in your life becomes a very difficult time period in your life. So I leave school, I leave Ball State, and I go back to Michigan City, and I enroll at uh, Purdue University Barker Center. All right, uh, and then I come back to Ball State, and then I leave Ball State, and I go back and I get a job in Michigan City. And then I come back to Ball State. And then I'm here at Ball State, but I'm working at one of the factories here in Michigan City. Then I come back to Ball State. So it's a, it's a reflection of the realities of life more than anything. Um, and, and I think uh, it's also one of those situations where if you start in one aspect of academia and you decide to move away from that, then that adds time to it also. So there, there, were, there were some things that were occurring that uh, uh, elongated the time. And I used to make a, a comment to people in Michigan City, I said, man, you still in school? And I said, give me some money and I'll graduate next quarter. You know, that's that sort of thing. You know, uh, so for me and for other kids, uh, it was difficult. I can remember working now over in Studebaker when Studebaker was eight stories. And on one of the uh, winter uh, breaks, it was Christmas break, my job was to remove the wax from the stairways of every level in that building. So I spent an entire week on my hands and knees scrubbing those stairs to get that wax off so they could resurface them and that sort of thing. I can remember one period where um, uh, I had to reduce my load, uh, but I still worked. I worked over in the La Follette, and we, they had, the university had a system called Campus Telephone Communication System. And what that, uh, that was is that you could call over to Neuer throughout the course of the night, and I would answer your phone. And you could ask a question about any particular subject, and I would put a cassette tape in you know, that addressed that particular subject. A little archaic, but during the time that was an innovation, you know, I was, I was there all night long, you know. So things like that, you know, that occurred. So, so when people say, boy, that was a long time you were in school, and I said, no, I said, you have to really uh, look at the circumstances and the situations that, that, that occurred. I worked as a supervisor in Michigan City for Michigan City Paper Box uh, for about a year during that PAM frame and uh, actually uh, finished up in 72. Actually finished up in uh, winter of 72 and then uh, the exercise, the graduation exercise. I said, well, no, I had, I had five courses that I had to take. Five PE courses five PE courses that I had to take in order to graduate. So I took folk dancing, badminton, golf, volleyball. I mean, it's ridiculous, you know, because I hadn't taken any of them, you know. So I had to take all of those courses just to, so I pushed it over into 73. But uh, uh, I was very proud still. I was very proud. Uh, uh, my uh, my mom was very proud, and because uh, I was the first person uh, in the family to uh, uh, receive a degree, and uh, so it w it was an accomplishment. It just took took longer than uh, we had anticipated. Yeah, but uh, when I came out, I I didn't have a whole lot of student loan. I think I had about twelve hundred dollars that I owed. That was it. Wow. You know so. You definitely worked your way through. Yeah, yeah, I was. And, and that was the story of some of them. Uh, you mentioned John, John Hall. I think you guys are going to interview him. And John will tell you it was the same thing. John was working at Allison's in Indianapolis every night, you know, and he would drive to Ball State in the morning, you know. So uh, married with a son. So those kinds of things change that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, short-term expectation, which is now pretty much five years anyway, but, uh, well, unless you take dual credit courses or something like that, but uh, in high school. Right. 
And then you went on to pursue your master's degree here. Yeah, I, uh, it, was, it was really interesting because I didn't think I was worthy of uh, that from a GPA standpoint. I did think I was worthy of it from an experience and from a, uh, a perspective of, of having uh, worked with, uh, uh, within the university and worked with a lot of people in a lot of capacities. But I was approached by um, the Office of Student Affairs, and at first I said, no, I have been in school way too long. I don't want to be in school anymore, you know. And so uh, eventually uh, they sent Bob Cody to talk to me, and Bob convinced me. And it was the greatest decision that, uh, that I made. Uh, there were four of us that were part of the program. It was Art Lax, Sarah Ford, and, uh, um, oh, uh, what was her name? Regalia, I'm trying to think of her first name. Becky, Becky Regalia. And uh, she was the only white person that was in that group. There were three blacks two males and two females that were in the group. And uh, it was quite an experience. I, I think a very, 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 very good experience for me. And uh, they were all in uh, studying for um, a degree in student, it wasn't student affairs, but it was student related. And I chose education sociology, which is kind of crazy. They didn't like that idea, but that was me. I, I wanted to do something that I thought was going to be meaningful. And unfortunately, the uh, month before graduation, I had to leave school. My mother died. Uh, actually, I left school and she died uh, a week later. And I was left with uh, raising an eight-year-old. So I was raising my eight-year-old brother at that point. And people said, well, and you had to have had opportunities to go back, you know, and finish it up. Well, I got involved in uh, a, a job situation and uh, spent a lot of time with uh, continuing studies and educational, uh, excuse me, business certifications and things of that nature. I went to Notre Dame and received a certification in uh, supervision, went to probably 20 American management courses, I mean, all kinds of different things that were related to what I was doing with my job and uh, uh, just continued to do that and never made it back. Mm -hmm. So. So were you, was it just you raising your eight-year-old brother then? Uh, yeah, until I got married. Yeah, until I got married. It was just me. Yeah. It was me and him. Me and him. So. And when did you get married? Uh, I got married in 1975. Right. Mm -hmm. And what was your wife's name? Sonora. Sonora. C-E-N-O-R-A. And mm -hmm. where did you guys meet? actually met her at a basketball game in Lafayette. Uh, so sports bringing people together. Yeah, again, sports right? again, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, my old high school team was rated number one in the state and uh, they were in the semi-state. So a friend of mine who was on our state championship team, he called me and said, hey, why don't you come on, uh, come on over to the game? And naturally I was being sort of braggadocious and uh, with all of the people down here in, in uh, central Indiana promoting uh, Muncie Central and then uh, Richmond and Kokomo and Marion. And I told them they haven't seen any basketball until they've seen Northwest Indiana basketball, specifically the Michigan City Red Devils. And uh, so anyway, we went uh, to the game and uh, she was riding with somebody else and she ended up riding back with us. and. I, I don't think I said anything other than hello to her. And, but one of her friends, you know, called me about two weeks later and said, hey, did you ever call that girl? Call her. I never got her number, you know. And so I did call her, and uh, the rest was history. Three years later, we were married, so. so. And did she help you raise your little brother, or? Mm -hmm. At that point, she did. Okay. Yeah, at that point, she did. They, everybody called it the ready-made family. You don't have to worry about having any kids right away because you got one already. And, uh, and so we didn't have children for five years, but uh, 
that gave us an opportunity to do a lot of things in terms of uh, just growing together and, and uh, experiencing, experiencing some of our, you know, young life, young married life. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is she still living today? Yes, yeah, she is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's, uh, she's down here this weekend. Uh, we'll celebrate 40 years uh, May 3rd. Congratulations. Yeah, 40 years, May 3rd, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, been one of the, uh, uh, the most high points in my life, really, mm -hmm. so. So, mm -hmm. um, I guess the year after you got married, then you started working at Heartmarks back in Michigan City. Yes, yeah, I started out, um, it, was, it, was re it was sort of unique because during those phases where, uh, one of those phases where, I had uh, not been attending Ball State, and I had uh, been working in Michigan City, uh, the human resources manager. Actually, before then, I worked for um, the associates uh, on the finance over in South Bend, and uh, I did that for a year, and then I, uh, about nine months, it wasn't a year, and then I came over to Hard Marks. But Stan Bandersky had been pursuing me and I really wasn't interested. And so I finally went out just as a courtesy to meet with him and he told me that uh, uh, he had a position, he didn't have a job description, he couldn't pay me any real money, and uh, was I interested? <laughs> now here I am with a college degree and he offered me a job for $3.50 an hour. But it was open-ended. And I think it was the open-endedness that attracted me because based upon what I did with the job uh, would set my salary. Mm -hmm. And so I went in as an auditor allocator uh, working for uh, the J. Mar Ruby Division in Michigan City. And mm, nobody knew me from any, you know, from a job responsibility from anyone else. And uh, I eventually became the uh, assistant uh, foreman. From there, I became the foreman. There, I became an assistant manager of peace goods and then manager of peace goods. Then I went over to finish goods where I was uh, uh, a manager, assistant manager, and then a manager. And eventually, I became the director of uh, Hartmark Sportswear Distribution Center. And I was responsibility. I had the responsibility for uh, not only uh, the uh, distribution center, but all uh, transportation and logistics, uh, and uh, uh, delivery and receipt of uh, uh, peace goods to uh, our five different plants that were in the South: uh, Kentucky, Alabama, uh, Tennessee. Uh, and even the one in Rochester, Indiana, and the one in New York. So uh, it truly was an open-ended type situation because it, it, for a while there, every two years, I was getting a promotion, 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 promotion. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, Stan had kept his word, you know, that if I, if, if, if I did my job and, and it was proved successful at it, that there would be opportunity. So I was able to take advantage of that. But it was kind of it was kind of raggedy to have somebody offer you three dollars and fifty cent an hour, <laughs> you know, with with a you know, with a wife and a, a, a young brother to raise. But we we did okay. We we made it happen. Okay. Yeah. And um, so I know you got um, when you graduated from Ball State, you had concentrations in business administration, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. you were definitely mm -hmm. utilizing at Hartmarks, but then mm -hmm. you also had concentrations in sociology and history. Yeah. Did you feel as if you were using those skills at Hartmarks? Well, I, I would say definitely sociology. I think one of the, um, one of the um, basis for my success is my ability to work very well with other people. Um, my, my basic philosophy is to uh, value them, treat them as, uh, as co-workers, not subordinates. I used to use the term, I don't, I don't wear the J on my sleeve. Everybody knows I'm boss when they come in the door, so I don't have to reinforce that you know, every day uh, uh, to communicate with them, to train them, to uh, set goals. 
uh, give them the resources to do their job. You know, I feel if I do all of those kinds of things and give you the expectations and, and then follow up with you, you know. And then I have a basic philosophy that was passed along to me by one of my mentors was that uh, if the only time employees see you coming, there's a problem, then eventually they don't want to see you coming. So I, again, to use that word balance, I believe in balancing the relationship. We have responsibilities. We have production schedules, we have commitments, we have all of those kinds of things. But at the same time, I, you're a person and I treat you as a person and I understand that things are going to happen day to day that will impact your ability to do your job. And if I can't recognize that or provide an, uh, an opportunity or an outlet for you to talk about those kinds of things, uh, and, and then I have unreasonable expectations, you know. I, I can remember when I was at um, uh, well, TJX. I'll just say TJX. I can remember a lot of different things, but uh, people would ask me, "How are you? How are you able to be successful? How are you able to talk with these people and, and get them to do things when everybody else is getting so much resistance?" You know, and I say, "Well, the first thing I do is I go out on the floor every day and I say hello to everybody. I say hello to everybody, and I say it with a smile. It's not a game. It's." I say hello to everybody, and everybody wants to be noticed, and, and they want to be respected. And then if there are situations that occur, I ask them for their input before I provide a solution. You know, so the person that's doing that job every single day is more apt to uh, be able to tell me about solutions than someone from afar. So that's the sociology part that you deal with, dealing with people, dealing with people in a meaningful way. So uh, that's how I see the sociology playing, playing into it. Uh, you know, I, I, had, I had an employee that was one of, one of the best workers in one of our departments. It was our giftware department. And I walked out on the floor and she just looked like the world was coming down on her. And, uh, and I asked her, I said, what's wrong? Uh, and uh, she said, well, I'm okay. And I said, well, you don't have to tell me if you don't want to because I don't want to pressure you into saying anything. I said, but if there's anything you need to talk about, you know you can talk about it with me. And she goes on to tell me this story that uh, over the weekend, on Friday night, she slept one place with her family, Tuesday, uh, uh, Saturday night, another place, and then Sunday, another place, because her son had observed somebody shoot somebody and they were now after them. And so she was on the run, and she says, I'm gonna to have to leave South Bend. And uh, so anyway, we talked about it, and I said, well, I'll tell you what, um, we'll alert the, you know, the police, we'll make your final check available immediately. We're not gonna wait until the end of the week or whatever, we'll do whatever is necessary. But in normal situations, people would look at that person and say, she's not doing her job, and she now needs to be corrected up for a penalty or whatever the case may be. But by taking the time to just inquire, she was able to realistically state her fear and what was going on. And as a result, we were able to help develop a solution that allowed her to leave without harm to her family. Because when she went back to her house, she said it was, the door was kicked in, the house was ransacked, bullet holes were in the door, all kinds of things, you know. Yet we're expecting some people to come in and, okay, hey, okay, <laughs> everything's okay. But that's the sociology part. And everybody doesn't have the opportunity to do that. I could do that because I'm the bo I was the boss. I could take the time to do some things that maybe some other people uh, could not do that, so. And it sounds like you used a lot of that empathy and the listening to others sure. that you talked about that you learned sure. even when sure. you were young. Yeah, uh, I've learned that active listening is so important and then getting the person to talk about it, not necessarily with me talking about it, getting the person to talk about it. Um, yeah, and like I said, that's the extension that's, that's carried through. That's, that's the constant. Is there anything you would like to talk about as far as heart marks or TJX goes, your work there, anything else? Uh, well, heart marks was, um, it was a very, very good 
uh, work situation for me. Um, I was able to grow. I had a lot of visibility. I met a lot of people um, because we were, um, we had companies uh, throughout the Midwest. We had companies on the East Coast. And, uh, and so as a result, I, I think I was able to grow professionally uh, there, but wasn't anything like TJX. That was the big time. When I went to TJX, and uh, uh, now you have to understand, TJX is the parent company for TJ Maxx, Marshalls, Winters, Home Goods, Home Sense, TK Maxx, and blah blah blah, and all of those. And they're the largest, uh, world's largest off-price retailer, with over 118,000 employees. And uh, just to be selected uh, as the operations manager. I thought was quite an achievement. Uh, it took six months for that process to take place. I don't know how many hundreds or thousands that they interviewed, but I know it was a lot of folks, you know. And for them to select me uh, said a lot uh, in terms to, uh, I think, the skill sets that I brought and the confidence that they had in me to take a neophyte building that was a million square feet with nothing in it, nothing and grow that business or start that business from the ground up and uh, bring in the first two employees and then when I left there were 750 employees. Wow. So um, that I was very proud of and it wasn't just me, it was a lot of other people that, uh, that were involved but my responsibility was the operations and, and processing and so I hired all of those people and brought them on board and uh, uh, we did our thing. You know, they later on decided to uh, uh, do some combination of distribution centers. I retired for two years. I came out of uh, that uh, with an urge to still make some contributions to the community uh, in, in whatever way. So I started volunteering and uh, got involved with uh, the Safe Harbor uh, after school enrichment program and uh, uh, the Hours for Hours mentoring program specifically started with one young man, then took on two, then took on three, then took on four. So I was there virtually uh, four days out of the five weeks. Then I went into the after school uh, portion of the program and I started writing and developing some programs that I had used, some of which I had used uh, during my professional life because I've always been involved in um, uh, student-related activities. So I coordinated the Youth Educational Services Program, the Academic uh, uh, Athletic Program, and various programs over the years. And so I had that. I'd worked with the Head Start. I'd worked with Junior Achievement. I'd uh, coached for eight years. I mean, all of those kinds of things. So it was a natural transition to go into the after school program and so they offered me uh, the position as um, the coordinator for the middle schools and so my responsibility has been bringing in uh, different programming activities and uh, speakers and setting up college visits and developing academic plans and things of that nature that uh, have, have really been interesting, have really been interesting. You know, I keep telling them I'm a neophyte, and they're telling me that, hey, you got, you're doing more than a whole lot of people that have been in this program for 20 years. But I think it's because of, again, that extension of wanting to see young people do well and, and being able to uh, provide some uh, experiences, some wisdom, some direction. Uh, one of the things that I really had to learn last year is how to think like a 14 year old and not think like a 60 plus year old because it's totally different. I can't go back and say, well, we used to do, no, because they, they've already looked at the gray hair in your head, so we already know there's, you know there's some things in their mind. So listening to what they have to say, you know, at the same time, ours is a grant driven program, making sure we're in compliance with what our responsibilities are academically for the state, but uh, we offer virtually anything you can think of 
uh, in our after school program, creative dance, um, chess, um, art, music, hip hop music, um, leadership uh, programs, um, character development, uh, horticulture, um, computer technology, you can go on and on and on. And people say, boy, that's a lot. And I said, well, it's 180 days in a year. You know, so if you break it down by three or four week periods, you need a lot, you know, so. So that's where it's, it's, it's come. Uh, like I said, TGX was a, was a tremendous opportunity. I got a chance to spend a lot of time on the East Coast and uh, uh, meet some power brokers from the business world, so. Please. And as far as your after-school enrichment program at Safe Harbor, mm -hmm. do you draw any parallels between that and then your time at Eli as a child? Yes, yes, yes. I definitely do. I definitely do. Uh, Charles Westcott told me, um, you know, in his latter years, he said, really, you know, people are always trying to say that kids today are different. He said, but in a sense, they're really not different. He said, all they really want is something to do, some place to go, and somebody to care. He said, that's all they really want. And he said, if you're able to do that, then you're probably gonna be fairly successful at what you do. And so I use that as uh, uh, part of my thought process when I'm trying to come up with ideas or trying to come up, there are, there are certain ones that are mandated by the state. I don't have any choice, I have to do those. But uh, we meet three hours per day, and uh, once we uh, completed our academic uh, homework and tutorial assistance, then that leaves us for about two hours to do some other things. And so I rotate each day with different activities. So Monday and Tuesday, Monday is this, two activities, Tuesday are these two, Wednesday are those two, and so forth. And then we come back and we repeat those, and we may do them for... Um, a two-week period or three-week period. Some are for the entire uh, grading period. Like we have a program called Boys to Young Men, and we have one that's called uh, Hidden Treasures. Both of those are targeted at teen and preteen uh, males and females to deal with some of the transitional aspects of their life. Um, I'm now 12 years old, but I'm going to be 13, and I'm concerned about this, and I'm meeting boys, and how do I do this, and I don't have any self-confidence, and I've got all of these things that are going on in my life. And so they're transitory type programs that, that we do to help them get through those and help them come up with ideas, whether it's uh, role playing, whether it's visitations to uh, different uh, 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 organizations in the community or having speakers come in and talk to them. Uh, it's just in a, a way of assisting them to let them know, one, uh, you're not the only one and this is not the first time. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to be all right. You know, but here's some things that you need to do. You need to organize your life. You need to do this. You need to do that. So, mm -hmm. but, uh, and so. How, do you, how do you get the kids to see this and how do you get them to see that, you know, their goals and their dreams are feasible? You have to really, really work at it. Uh, what I've been doing lately is personalizing it. For example, um, two Mondays ago, I, my college and career ready coach, uh, she took another position, so she was reporting to me, so I came in and I said, okay, I'm gonna do it probably to the end of the uh, spring, uh, spring break. And so what I started to focus on was not the career portion of the program uh, in getting a job, I wanted them to focus on the skills that if I were an employer, what would I be looking at uh, uh, in, in terms of what they could bring to the employment world. Taking those same skill sets that they bring to the employment world and, and showing the connectedness to how those same skills are important in terms of their classroom. You need to be organized, you need to communicate, you need to respect authority, you need to uh, have teamwork, you need to be prepared, you need to be punctual, you need to do all those things. And taking that one step further is that now I want you to write me a resume 
to tell me that you are ready to, or that you are looking to graduate from the seventh grade to the eighth grade and the eighth grade to the ninth grade. I'm not concerned about the job. I'm concerned about immediacy and what sort of skills that you can bring to it. Now, that sounds like a ninth class during the period, during the, during the day, but the kids got into it. They got into it because it was personal, and now they're thinking about, well, you know what? He's actually right, because if we do this, this, and this, we're going to be successful. And so, the, so you try to find some medium that's going to bring um, uh, a relevance to them, uh, that's going to bring some fun to them, um, that they feel very comfortable with. You know, for example, in that setting, there are no wrong answers. Whatever they submitted as, uh, as the skill, strong skill sets, I took it. One kid asked, well, yeah, we're asking, why do you come to school every day? And he says, I come to school every day because if I don't, they're going to arrest my mom. I could have said wrong answer. Yeah, I didn't say that. I said that was not the primary answer that I'm looking for, but it's a very realistic answer because students are in that type of situation. And by it being a real answer, it's the correct answer. And so we just try to do it that way and just constantly encourage and support and do those kinds of things. Does everybody get it? No. Do we win all the time? No. But that's why we have such a variety of programs because uh, I use what I developed as the E-concept. And the E-concept basically is a foundation for uh, our program, uh, it, excellence, extraordinary, you know, uh, all, all the kinds of things that, that we want to be to the kids. And so as a result, every program that we implement, you know, entails the E concept. So if you're getting it over here in chess, but you're not really getting it in computer technology, that's fine as long as you get it. You know, so we're offering that variety. Uh, we're starting horticulture on Monday. Mm -hmm. Is all the kids going to be into horticulture? No, but those that aren't are going to do with positive flow drumming. Positive flow drumming is just using drums as a means of uh, communication, uh, teamwork, responsibility, you know, coordination, all of those kinds of things. So, uh, so there's different ways of, of, of trying to achieve the, uh, the same goal. Uh, but we do, a, we do a fairly good job of it. Mm -hmm. We do. So in addition to interacting with students through mm -hmm. this after-school program, you also are very involved with the African American Alumni Association mm -hmm. at Ball State. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me a little about that? Well, um, you know, why stay so involved? Well, I, 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 can t I like to tell you how it got started. Way back in the, um, the late 70s, uh, the black students had gotten together to come back for a reunion on campus. It was organized by the black students. It was out in the community. And uh, we were doing a lot of uh, unstructured, loosely defined type activities, you know. And um, uh, Dave Davis and Linda Wilson, and I'll give them credit for being the, uh, the primary people for organizing those kinds of activities. But um, ran into Ed Shipley. And Ed sat down and he talked with us about working from within rather than working from outside the university structure and how beneficial it could be for the black alum and the university. And so as a result, that was really this, this sort of the, um, the impetus to, to, to come inside. So at that point, we formed the Black Alumni Constituent Society and uh, uh, started to try to put together some activities that we would hope would bring students back, former students back on a regular basis or participate in the university structure on a, on a regular basis. Um, and the black alumni group um, I think over the years is, is, has evolved 
We just came up with a new strategic plan that we're hoping that will make them more engaged, more active, add more structure to the program uh, uh, from a black alumni standpoint and from a university standpoint. We, we really got to get involved more with the university. Uh, I'm down here all the time for a lot of different activities and uh, I would like to see more of our alums you know, uh, participate uh, and do some of the things that we actually did with this uh, special programs house. Uh, I was down at the beginning of the school year for the welcome back picnic and I have to say it was one of the most pleasurable activities I've uh, had on the campus in, in a long, long time. It was sponsored by the Office of Multicultural Affairs. It was not limited to African American students. There were students from the general populace, the international students, white students. I, I say within the four hours that I was there, uh, there were easily you know, a couple of thousand students that came through there. Uh, I will be back uh, for the um, celebration of excellence uh, March the 1st prior to uh, 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 graduation, there's a Unity Week activity. Those are all things that were initiated uh, during the special programs era, and so we really need to do that. Uh, I work the admissions um, table at the Black Expo every year, uh, as do some other alumni, in trying to encourage uh, people to attend Ball State or provide information so they can make a, 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 d a rational decision on whether they're going to attend Ball State or not. Uh, so a, a lot of those kinds of things we just need to do more of to support the university uh, in addition to financial contributions and things of that nature. So, mm -hmm. But um, uh, it was from there that uh, uh, I became a member of the Alumni Council and uh, I served on the Alumni Council for uh, several years before going on the executive committee and then once I was on the executive committee it's a it's sort of a progressionary process before you become the president of the Alumni Association so I was the president of the Alumni Association in 1998-99 and uh, wonderful experience wonderful experience um, some some fun stories about People that talked to me on the phone, and then when they saw me in person, I was sort of surprised that, okay, he's African American. Well, that's okay, you know, but uh, never deterred anything, never deterred anything. But uh, it was a very good experience. Uh, Hollis Hughes was the first one who was president, and then I was second, then Dr. Charles Green followed me, and then Fred Cox uh, was the most recent a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, it's great to hear that you're um, retaining the university alumni involvement. I yeah, really like to yeah. Hear that. It's, it's been a ball. Yeah. It's been a ball. Well, unfortunately, we're almost out of time, but before we close the interview, um, is there anything I haven't asked you about your life or your Ball State experiences you want to talk about? Uh, no, you've been pretty thorough. Uh, I, I've been involved in Ball State in a lot of other capacities. Mm -hmm. I participated in the, uh, uh, the Dialogue Days, which at one time were the College of Business Days. Uh, I've been on probably at least uh, four different task force here at Ball State, uh, different committees. I was on a task force that put together the, uh, uh, that dealt with some of the violence that was taking place in the 90s, uh, different things of that nature. Uh, I'm also sitting now on the library board, thanks to uh, uh, John Straw, uh, uh, Board of Governors for the Library Board. So it's, it's, it's been, it's, it's really been something that has been very meaningful to me and I would not have done it if I didn't have a, an affinity toward Ball State. Uh, I, I came to Ball State with, I think, you know, uh, some talents and some skills and some capabilities and I think I was able to refine those and maybe even define those even further in addition to getting an academic degree and all of those kinds of things. And I, I early on saw some things that I could do that I thought might be helpful and I still feel that way. I, I don't think I'm, uh, I have the answers to catch all, do all or anything like that, but I, I think it's important that 
uh, alumni give back. If you don't have money, give back in service, give back in some way, uh, represent your alma mater. Uh, uh, that, that's, that's very important to me. Uh, and and I, I don't see myself s slowing down too much, even though it's, it's a lot because of all my involvements in so many different things back home. But uh, it, it's important that uh, the students here today uh, see alum. You know, I, I can't force anybody else to do anything, but I can control uh, my uh, participation and my visibility and my communication with, uh, with uh, some of the students. And it's not just black students. You know, uh, 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 that's one of the things with the uh, Alumni Association. Uh, you're able to participate in a well-rounded number of activities that they support and sponsor. So. So it's, it's been a good ride. It's been a very good ride. Uh, I've met an awful lot of good people. I think the university has made uh, a lot of progress uh, in, in terms of increasing enrollment, in terms of uh, trying to uh, provide an environment that uh, is receptive to diversity. Uh, so, uh, as those things happen, then I'm supported. I'm totally supportive, so. And uh, not to say everything is right, but uh, everything's not right in my house either, but uh, so, so you, you continue to work and you continue to try to improve and, and help out where you can, so. And I thank you for the interview. Thank you for your participation right. in the interview and for your continued involvement at the university. Thank I you. really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.